PowerPoint going. So uh, today what we're going to do, um, normally this would have been a very interactive workshop. Uh, unfortunately, it's Zoom. So I'm going to try to make it as close to what we originally envisioned as possible with this PowerPoint. Um, so this is going to talk about the, the process of exhibits and, and how we came up with Gazing Deeply in the hope that it helps inspire ideas for all of you and the museums you work with or near. Um, because really, I think, as Chris has put it, you know, this is a dream and the fact that we were able to marry art and science together in this and do something so local and meaningful to our community, I think is what's going to make this exhibit um, just resonate throughout Kentucky. And despite the pandemic, uh, we are going to keep the exhibit on view for at least two years whenever we reopen to the public, <laughs> which uh, the date has not been determined yet. Um, so we're, we are dedicated to keeping this up for as long as possible because it's just, personally, I love to think that this is that great of an exhibit. Um, so as Chris introduced, I'm the curator, lead curator for the exhibit. Um, I hate being called sole curator because no exhibit is one person's venture. Um, I also serve as the developing, development and marketing manager. Um, I hold a master's in public history, which is basically a, a history degree for people who want to work specifically with teaching history to the public in non-educational means, in, not in a classroom. Um, I've curated over 20 exhibits and produced three podcasts. And uh, really, uh, as much as my focus is history, I have personal passions for art and science. Uh, I watch science documentaries almost every night. <laughs> so um, even though I didn't have the grades to become a scientist, uh, I just absolutely love the fact that you can combine all of these fields and spark positive change in the community and hopefully in the world. Um, so what is Gazing Deeply? It's a physical exhibit at the museum, but an exhibit can be much more than that. In order to kind of make this reach the broadest possible audience, we also did a virtual supplemental exhibit that took a deep dive into some of the topics shown in the physical installation. Um, and this means that we were able to include more links to documents and special collections, videos of projects that have happened in Mammoth Cave or things that students could do, and basically being able to present the information to people who could not physically come to the exhibit. Um, as a result of the pandemic, the museum was able to acquire video equipment, and we are also doing 360 degree virtual tours of exhibits that people can actually do on their own. And I'll show you how to do the one for Gazing Deeply uh, at the end of the presentation. But exhibits are also, they also have um, four other kind of goals. They're educational outreach. So you have classes and community members coming in to actually learn things. Um, they're a forum to encounter issues in the community and, and spark discussion on those issues. You, you hope that visitors, uh, whether they come alone or together, are going to talk about what they've seen with others and hopefully initiate some conversations that lead to action. Um, and in doing that, it becomes a platform for environmental advocacy, uh, especially in Mammoth Cave and, and the Kentucky region. And then it becomes a connection. Um, one of the biggest things is our longstanding partnership with Mammoth Cave National Park. We wanted to make sure that if anyone came to our museum to see this, they immediately wanted to go to Mammoth Cave and take a tour and find out all they could about it. Um, the, the visitor center at Mammoth Cave is just astounding. And uh, we really just hoped that it would help spur tourists who maybe are just stopping in Bowling Green for the night on their way somewhere else and they go, oh, Mammoth Cave is just an hour up the road, like let's stop there tomorrow or something like that. So every exhibit starts with an idea. And, and this is what we call the spark. Um, for Chris and I, it was working on Out of the Box, which involved faculty from across the campus and looked at a bunch of different things in the museum's collections. It was kind of a way to test some new ideas about how we engage faculty and students with the museum. And in talking about that and having Chris contribute to the section we had on Mammoth Cave, as he shared, we then kind of got this traveling exhibit proposal. Um, and I don't even remember the exhibit this time, but the exhibit was all about art and science working together on environmental issues. And 
being a small museum, we didn't have the budget to host this exhibit, but it, it was kind of the, the dual spark. Hey, we're already working with these people. Like, can we take this and do our own spin on it? Can we make this a lot more relevant to our community so that instead of it talking about global or national issues, we're talking about something very specific and local and meaningful to the people who live here. Um, and so that leads into all these other steps that kind of go into an exhibit. Um, one of the biggest things I emphasize as a curator is partnerships. I don't think that any exhibit should be curated by one person. Um, partnerships are what makes a topic engaging. And we'll go into the different partners uh, in a minute. And those partner, in talking to those partners, you take this idea and you start brainstorming it out. And that those brainstorming sessions lead to what you want to accomplish with the exhibit, what your goals are. Um, and for us, you know, that was educating. It was providing something that both the campus and community could use. But it was also trying to foster this sense that even though Mammoth Cave is an hour up the road, it's still very close by. And all this, this karst landscape of South Central Kentucky is so integral to everything that happens in Kentucky. It's integral to where we build our houses, the kinds of businesses that are here, um, everything right down to the, uh, the whiskey industry <laughs> and, and bourbon industry um, here in Kentucky relies on the karst landscape. And so we, we developed goals that were about environmental conservation in that context. And then that leads into this final step of outlining. Um, and that's where you really start to formulate your story. Um, and, and the other part, the part that emphasizes through all of this is that you're collaboratively going through this process. You're, you're finding your partners and then you're going through this together because every voice has a story to tell. And together those make up a really engaging story that you can do with just one or two people. And so partnerships are key. And the biggest thing in partnerships is that you have to trust each other. Um, at the museum, we trusted the experts. We trusted Chris and his team at the Crawford Hydrology Lab. We trusted the instructors we worked with at the art department on WKU's campus, the experts from Mammoth Cave National Park who came in and helped guide us, review information, make sure that everything we were saying was factual and was what they would want the public to know. And we also had some uh, auxiliary partners, uh, Bat Conservation International in particular, uh, I reached out to them and they were able to provide us a lot of educational materials we could use about white nose syndrome and bats to kind of help uh, provide extra things that teachers could take back to their classroom or students could do while they were in the exhibit to better talk about the issues surrounding bat conservation. The other thing is trusting the curators. Um, that would be me and WK students, especially Madison Whittle, who is an art major, we're the ones who know how to take all that, that expert information, all that academic jargon and technical language and make it make sense for the common person. Um, most curators I know who go through at least a master's program, we are taught how to take information and put it into a fifth grade reading level. Um, when I was in grad school, they told us fifth grade reading level is the standard across America. That is the average reading level of every American. And so when we curate, we try to use language that a fifth grader would understand because it makes it accessible to K through 12 viewers, but it also makes it accessible to adults of various learning abilities. And then finally, trusting the designers. Um, Charles Hurst and Eleanor Davidson, as Chris mentioned, were the, the museum designers behind this. They are the ones who imagined what it looked like, helped figure out layout issues, helped coordinate colors, did 3D modeling to make sure everything was going to work together. And then they're the ones who spent weeks upon weeks actually constructing the exhibit. And uh, Madison Whittle, the WQ student, was also part of that. I will show you what she did in a minute. Um, and then another important part that a lot of people forget is that you have to trust your audience. You have to trust that the people coming to see this exhibit know how to learn. Because innately, every human does know how to learn. It's, it's built into us. It's how we survive. Um, but a lot of times I find that museums tend to discredit whether audiences can learn. And 
that, that just doesn't work. You have to trust that the people coming to you and the people who walk into the exhibit want to learn this topic. There is something about it that attracts them and that automatically opens the doorway to learning. So the meat of this presentation is how you build a great story. Having worked with various museum organizations and in, in different interpretive capacities, I kind of have a framework which I call the four steps to a great story. Um, and, and this is how you can both design an exhibit, but also write an exhibit. So I'm going to go through the design first and then we'll touch briefly on writing. But the, the key thing to remember here is the four steps. One, you wanna get your audience involved. You wanna, you wanna make them want to see this. Then you wanna tell them what the actual story is. You wanna introduce your topic in a way that if somebody has no idea what Mammoth Cave is, now they know. Now they have at least some base understanding of what this place is and why it's important. Third, you wanna blow their mind. Um, the biggest thing about this was showing that art and science work together. It's something that so many people, even in, in universities, don't think go together well, but art and science are really integral to each other. They are very complementary, and studying both is a huge key in a lot of ways to not only the, the issues we were trying to interpret and spark action on, but also to learning in general. And as a university museum, that is something we wanted to showcase. Because I'm sure, as, as many of you know, the arts have faced decreased funding in recent years, and we really wanted to show that, you know, it's not one or the other. You need both to be successful in your career and in life. And then finally, you have to end with something fun or relevant. Um, and this kind of helps bring the viewer back. You, you've gotten into the meat of the story. You've, got, you've blown their mind. Now you've got to make it to where they're going to remember this. And there's two ways to do that. You make it fun to where they're, they're really excited about it. It's like a kid in a candy store. Like it's just a boom. Or you make it very relevant. And in this case, we, we tended to err on the relevant side, but we still kind of made it fun. You know, you can travel, you can learn this, you can do this. And that really grabs people. So in designing the exhibit, um, the first step was to get the audience involved. And a lot of this was our designers. Um, as you can see, we made a very intriguing entrance. When you walk into the museum, this is actually the first exhibit you see. You can see it from the front door. So Eleanor and Charles had the amazing idea to actually recreate parts of a cave in the exhibit, um, inspired by what Mammoth Cave does at their interpretive center. And this is all concrete and plaster and paint and wire mesh. I mean, I cannot tell you the amount of hours that went into this, but it's actually something that you can touch. Um, and we encourage people to touch it. And it feels very realistic. I was actually shocked at how realistic it felt. And the, the pop of color, the choice of putting like some artifacts out, this is all to kind of draw you in and say, hey, there's, there's some really cool stuff in here. And so a lot of people that saw it as it was developing um, were definitely interested. And they, we had quite a few people trying to sneak peeks behind the curtain um, as we were putting things up. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we closed, I think, about two weeks after this exhibit opened, so we hadn't had any major groups yet. We actually had to cancel the, the reception and everything, um, but I'm pretty confident people are really going to, to love this. And then the other thing is, in these artifact cases, um, we had a selection of geological samples, but also some artifacts. And these on the right, this, this is a pair of woven moccasins that were found by Gabrielle Robertson in the 1930s when she was uh, exploring Mammoth Cave with some of the scientists. And I believe they were found in what is known as Salt's Cave. It's now part of Mammoth. Um, and we don't really know too much more about them, but we know that they're really, really old. Um, and so that it, it kind of just sparks, the choice of including those was to say, hey, this, you know, people love things that are really old really valuable, really curious, you know, the mystery of it. And that's kind of what these spark is. There were people in this cave long before you and I, and this is one of the things they left behind. 
So we've gotten people intrigued. Now we have to introduce them to the topic. And so the next section of the exhibit talked about what Mammoth Cave is and then what scientists actually do in the cave. And as scientists, I'm sure you know, it's very complicated. So distilling it down was the key for this. Um, and we, we kind of did it in a way that we focused on the three main things that scientists do. They explore the cave, they study the cave, and they share what they've learned. And so we had different selections talking about that, different images illustrating what these steps are. And then uh, Madison Whittle, as I mentioned, um, Chris and his colleagues came up with this great timeline of exploration at Mammoth Cave. And Madison chose to illustrate this using a, a semi-map of the cave and then putting uh, little labels where the significant events were supplemented by photographs and prints. And it actually, um, the artifact you see is actually the moccasins. So from right to left, it actually starts about the, the prehistory of the cave before humans. And then each color section is kind of one kind of era of exploration, you know, the prehistoric, the Native American, early explorations and mapping, and then getting more into when photographers came in, artists came in, and then the actual scientific expeditions into the cave. And this section really helps the audience form a basis so that if somebody comes in and they already know a lot about Mammoth Cave, they can kind of breeze through this section pretty well. But if they don't know a lot about it, they can actually spend some time to learn some very key things about how scientists have worked in the cave and the history of that work and why it kind of ties all together. Um, and so part of this section, we threw in some surprises and we made sure to mix labels with photographs and artifacts to tell the story. And that's really important because I'm sure as some of you teachers may know, you can show kids a PowerPoint all day long. Whether they retain the information is totally up to them. Um, so to keep their eyes from glossing over, museums mix artifacts in because it really helps people to touch something 3D or at least see something 3D and connect that. So um, the Jumar rope that is on display, we actually have photographs of students using that in the cave. Um, and all the equipment that is on display, there are photographs nearby that illustrate how that equipment is used. So it really kind of helps people imagine what it's like to handle this every day. We also threw in a surprise. Uh, this exhibit space had previously uh, had an exhibit on Bosnians in Kentucky, and one of the spaces in it had been a recreation of a Bosnian living room, a more traditional Bosnian living room. And so initially we had no idea what to do with the space. It was this big square in the wall. Um, and Charles and Eleanor came up with the idea inspired by Mammoth Caves Interpretive Center to recreate a 3D cave environment. Um, they used a photograph of Mammoth Cave as the back and then kind of built out from there. So it looked like you were looking into the cave itself. And then uh, they actually, <laughs> what, what you see on the floor is actual dirt and rocks. <laughs> That, that similar to what's found in the cave and equipment. So it kind of made it look like somebody's in there exploring and it's just a, it doesn't really serve a huge interpretive function, but it comes right in the middle of the exhibit. So it's this nice kind of break area. We have a bench in front of it. You can sit down, you can take a moment to kind of absorb what you've been learning before moving on to the next part. And it just, a lot of people kind of stop and go, whoa, and it's just that, that moment to kind of break things up for people. And it's almost like giving a break in the middle of class. So we've introduced everything. People know the story. It's time to blow their minds. And we did this in two ways. We had one section that was about taking art and interpreting it with science, and then taking science and interpreting it with art and showing how these two, how these two disciplines really work together. Um, the first part, art to science. We took historic paintings, engravings, and illustrations from the cave that were held by WKU Special Collections. And we asked uh, some of the, the karst rock stars, as Chris calls them, 
to tell us what they saw. Now, I mean, anybody can describe an image, but it's really interesting to see what a scientist sees when they look at an art print of a cave, especially if they're very familiar with that cave. And um, as the text from Art and Peggy Palmer, for one, showed, um, they talked about how the image is meant to spark curiosity, but how in doing that, there's actually some things that have been exaggerated or added for impact so that what you see in this historical illustration from 1873 isn't what you'd actually see today. Um, we've seen other projects where scientists take art and use it to identify potential changes in the cave, but having Art and Peggy really point out that, you know, it's not a change in the cave. They, they exaggerated that because of their goal. Really helps show that Number one, we can't always rely on what the artist did. We have to consider motivations. But number two, that there's a lot more to learn than just, you know, what's changed. It's also learning what people thought about the cave and what they were trying to do in the cave in the early explorations. So the next section was taking science and interpreting it through art. And this is the biggest part of the exhibit. In talking with Chris and everyone at Mammoth Cave, we identified three core conservation issues. Air quality, water quality, and white nose syndrome in bats. And what we decided to do was Chris and his team and his students worked with art instructor Julie Shuck, who is a scientific illustrator by trade, and her students, and took data from the cave and created artworks based on that data to help people understand. And Julie did some panels about different kinds of scientific illustrations and how art helps us understand science. But I think the most impactful sections or parts of this are where Julie is actually taking that data and turning it into art. She did uh, three works, each illustrating an issue. And then the students got to pick different issues in the cave, um, similar to or different from and do a lot of artworks. And I think in total we had over, I wanna say 80 artworks by these students that are hanging in the exhibit. It's, it's absolutely incredible. And the benefit to WKU is that now Chris and Julie are working together on this. And, and I hope they'll work together in the future too to have students do more of this and possibly exhibit it in the museum. But it really showed that you could take two classes that seem like totally opposite worlds and have them do something together that is very meaningful and creative and most of all fun for the students. A lot of the students had fun with this. Um, and as you'll see on this slide, this is actually uh, Julie's image on air quality. And so the reason we chose these three issues is air quality declined really badly at Mammoth Cave, but then thanks to legislation and action in the community, it started getting better. Water quality, kind of stays the same. There are things that affect it, but it's, it's relatively stable compared to the others. And then bats, especially white nose syndrome, this is something that is probably one of the most pressing needs in, in karst landscapes. Um, and so we wanted to show that even though there are some things that stay the same, there are other issues where human action can have massive effects and it can either decimate a population or it can bring it back from the brink. And in showing that air quality was something we were able to bring back from the brink, we're hoping to inspire that change with bats and really get people to understand that the actions they do here in Bowling Green, at their homes, at their workplaces are going to have an effect on the bats of Mammoth Cave. And we need to work together to solve those issues and help bring them back. Um, a, a final thing that we kind of did, and this was kind of an aside, but we ended up having some extra space in the exhibit and in talking with Chris, one of the things that a lot of people just don't understand is the scientific method. Um, it, it can be a very abstract concept, but it's something that people can understand when it's framed in the right way, especially for people who just have no inclination in science. So in thinking about this, I was like, what, what part of Bowling Green is so big that everyone will understand it if we start talking about it? And that's baseball. Bowling Green uh, has the WKU Hilltoppers, 
but we also have the minor league team, the Hot Rods. So baseball is pretty big around here. Um, we partnered with WQ Athletics to get photographs of last season's baseball games and the statistics. And we took that and said, okay, what if a season of baseball is a scientific experiment? And over that season, you have multiple games, each one being its own individual experiment. And at the end of that season, all of those things add up and tell you whether the Hilltoppers are the best. And so we took that, we broke it down into the scientific method and said, you know, here's, we're, we're making a hypothesis, here's our evidence and our testing, and here's our conclusions. And so as you'll see in the 360 tour, you can dive kind of into the details of it, but it really helps, especially people who uh, don't have scientific backgrounds, understand that this method is unbiased. It's based solely on evidence and it has informed everything in this exhibit. And in the same way that you have almost no control over the outcome of a baseball game you're watching, you really have no control over what the evidence is going to tell you when you're using the scientific method. So whether you like it or not, it's still true. And then finally, we ended with something very fun and relevant. Um, and this kind of took a couple different things because we work with both a campus and a community. So we wanted to make sure that whoever was viewing this got that fun or relevant kick to it at the end. Um, we started by talking about, you know, science and art work together. This exhibit was a collaborative effort and it's going to take all of us to address the issues that you've seen here. But then we also said, you know, in addressing that, you can have a lot of fun. You can have a really exciting career and maybe earn quite a bit of money <laughs> if that's the motivation. So some of the panels that we had, um, when you walk in, you actually first see the travel section. Um, this is where we highlighted the sister parks to Mammoth Cave around the world and talked a little bit about what each one was like and showed some pictures of it to say, basically, you can go, if, if you're studying Mammoth Cave, you can go see these other really awesome places. And then we talked about the process of kind of creating the artworks that you see in the exhibit and showing that, you know, science isn't all lab work. It can also be very creative and you have to communicate information to people. Um, and in doing that, we were able to talk about, and this is especially for WKU students, the types of careers for which you would have to study both the arts and sciences to be successful in. And the list we included was just a very small portion of, a, of the list that I found um, in researching this and all the different careers that started popping up in Google when I was searching for this. Um, and some of them even kind of surprised me. And then finally, we talked about more the the benefits. And this was from um, uh, Americans for the Arts does a study every few years about what the impact of studying both arts and sciences has on people, both individually and collectively. Um, so it was really important that we illustrate that, you know, hey, if you study, if you're a WKU student and you study both the arts and sciences, you are two times more likely to graduate, five times less likely to drop out. And over the course of your life, you'll be 50% more active in your community and have a 63% less likely chance of developing dementia. So it's, it's really kind of like a, a wow moment. And that's both for students and for parents because the museum does see a lot of prospective WKU students coming in. So being able to illustrate that, you know, hey, mom and dad, I know you want him to be a doctor or, you know, you want him to, to be a very successful person, but he, he or she is going to need this interdisciplinary background not just because it's going to open a lot of doorways and career paths, but also because it's going to have some very personal effects in their lives that could really make their lives much more vibrant and meaningful. And so that's how we kind of created this fun and relevant section. We're, we're telling people you can travel, you can learn things, you can earn money, you can benefit it. You're hopefully not going to get dementia as early, <laughs> although there's obviously a lot of other factors in that, but it really kind of helps solidify that all this information is relevant to an individual. Um, so in using these four steps, we also use it to draft the text within the exhibit. Um, on the left is the text that Chris actually submitted to me. Um, all of the labels were written by Chris and Julie and their teams. Um, very little was actually written by myself and the curatorial team. So 
the thing that a curator does will take what people talk about and what the scientists and the artists say. And our job is to distill it down in the simplest terms possible. Most museum labels, at least the good ones, um, will be no more than 75 to 100 words at most. Um, even less if you're doing a label for like an object or just to talk about a picture. Um, and that's because people, people have short attention spans. It's just like students in a classroom that you've got to either hook them immediately or you've lost them. So taking Chris's great text, which I mean, personally, I understood it and I was just like, oh, I want to learn more. But looking at it, it's like, okay, we need to cut out any extra information. And to do that, we use the four steps. So the first thing you want to do when talking is get the audience involved. So the big thing is 320 million years ago, this cave is 320 million years old. Like that is a whoa moment. Um, I also find it really interesting that Kentucky was once part of a tropical sea, but some people don't. Then we get into what's the story. Okay, so if it's 320 million years old, well, how, how did it form? Like, how did this cave come into being? And that's this part in red. And then you get more into the mind blown part. And this is where Chris did great about talking about all the different conditions that go into creating a cave. But to talk about that to the general public, you just kind of have to go boom, boom, boom. So we were like, okay, there's other ideal conditions for the cave. But what makes this important is that all these things, rain and temperatures and vegetation, these provide carbon dioxide, which acts as an acid. And for the average Joe or Jane, carbon dioxide is the thing we expel through our mouths when we breathe. It's, it's just in the air. You don't think about the fact that carbon dioxide can act as an acid, that it can actually change the world around you. And so this starts those, those wheels turning of, wait a minute, that's something I never knew about something that is pretty basic to my life. Um, and then finally, we end with something really fun and relevant. Um, in the case of this label, it was saying the Green River. Most people in South Central Kentucky have heard of or know what the Green River is. So it's, it's very relevant because it's something that they encounter a lot more than perhaps encountering in the cave. And, and those labels, I mean, th those things, sometimes it's one label, sometimes it's a series of labels that take the four steps. It just depends on the design of the exhibit. Um, and that's where you really trust, you know, your curators and whoever's writing it to understand how to tell that story the best way. Um, finally, the end of the exhibit was acknowledging our teamwork. Um, the museum makes a point to do it, not just in panels, but also on websites, marketing materials. And every time we talk, do interviews, related audio podcasts, things like that. We try to acknowledge as many people as we can. Um, so I do wanna say a big thank you to everyone who made this exhibit possible. Chris and his team, Julie, Rick Toomey, Leanne, Autumn, just all the, the park rangers, the scientists, the researchers, um, everyone who contributed even just a sentence to this exhibit was listed on this panel. Um, also listed was the people who funded the exhibit. Uh, National Speleological Foundation, the National Speleological Society, and the Dorothy Greider Art Exhibit Fund. And then, of course, special thanks uh, to Barclay Trimble, Bruce Powell, and Tim Pinion for allowing us to do this um, without their consent to doing this exhibit. It, it simply wouldn't have come into being. And then finally, we, we wrapped it up by saying, you know, all of these people are important, but so are all of the scientists, artists, students, and explorers who taught us about Mammoth Cave and helped us understand this environment. And so you can't always acknowledge everyone in an exhibit. Sometimes the teams are just too long, but trying to do that is really important because it not just, it doesn't just, you know, help the benefits of thanking someone. It helps people understand that what they're seeing is a collaborative effort of a lot of people and that in working together, we produce something pretty awesome. And that in itself has power because it also helps communities understand that they have to work together. Um, so I wanna kind of wrap up uh, before we get into the, the actual exhibit tour and, and just showing you some of the, the things we have. Um, some of the tips that I have when you're 
when you're working with exhibits. Uh, the first is be kind. Be kind to others, but also to yourself. Exhibits and any kind of related program are a very intensive process. They can be very frustrating. They can be very exciting. But most of all, you're, you're going to have to be kind to yourself because there are times where you're going to want to just chuck it out the window. And there are times you're going to want to shout it on the rooftops. So just being kind to yourself and others throughout the process is really key to having a good time throughout it. Um, also, be inquisitive and curious. Uh, I personally went into this not knowing a lot about Mammoth Cave, but I was very interested in it. Um, that stems partially from my personal passion for science, but I was also just really curious because I've only been in Kentucky about five years now. I've been to Mammoth Cave a few times, but I just, I haven't learned a lot about it. I haven't had the time. So this was an opportunity for me to really learn from the experts and the designers. And I mean, even learning how to create a fake stalactite with Eleanor was just mind blowing to me. It was something I'd never thought I'd learn. Um, you also need to be willing to learn from others, which is part of that curiosity, but also willing to teach because you're going to work with people that may have no background in this. They may have no understanding of what this topic is. So you have to be very patient in helping them understand that. Um, but, you know, I'd say that the top two tip is be willing to change and be willing to fail. Um, nine times out of 10, an exhibit idea that we have is not what goes on display. From the moment you have that idea to the moment the exhibit opens, things can change very radically. New information can pop up, just like scientific studies where you could be working on something and suddenly somebody publishes a paper that changes a major portion of what you're working on. Um, things can happen in exhibit planning. There, there may be a new interpretive strategy or technology. It could just be new information about your topic. Um, so being willing to change throughout that process and kind of be very open to that is important, but also being willing to fail. Um, you may fail in a collaboration, you may fail in a small part of it, or you could just fail spectacularly. I have seen exhibits that had thousands upon thousands of dollars in them and they failed spectacularly because somebody didn't consider a key issue or there just wasn't interest. They didn't, figure out that there was interest in the topic before they dedicated all this time and money to it. Um, and there are ways to mitigate that, but ultimately you never know if something is going to be successful till it opens. And I think because of the pandemic, um, while we all have the feeling that this exhibit is going to be very successful in our community, we're simply not going to know that till we have people walking through the door to see it. Um, but most importantly, you need to have fun. You need to have fun doing all of these things. You need to be interested in what you're doing because creating an exhibit is a very different process from just about anything else. But it can also be really fun because you get to be almost as creative as you possibly can in doing it. If you can think about it, the designers and the curators can probably find out a way to do it barring any major financial <laughs> inhibitions on it. So exhibits can be it can just be a really, it's like being back in fifth grade science fair. Like you're just doing something that's really cool. You may not have any idea how it's going to turn out, but it's just fun. It's just so much fun. Um, so that's it for the PowerPoint. Um, we'll have time for Q and A. Um, I am always available for questions. Uh, my email is on this slide. Um, feel free to reach out. I, I'm happy to talk more. I'm happy to talk to other people. Um, if you have an idea for an exhibit, you just want to run by somebody or just want to know a little bit more about how we did something, always happy to talk. Um, so we have links to the virtual exhibit, which has all of the extra uh, components to it. Let me see if this will open it. I don't know if it'll share the screen. I hope it'll share it. Nope, it's not going. There we go. Okay. Um, so the virtual exhibit is hosted on our website. Um, it's got pictures and things, but it's also, it's a really easy way, especially for faculty to send students to look at very key specific information. Um, we even linked into things like Mammoth Cave's own virtual tour of the historic route, um, blow ups of some of the artifacts on display, 
but also links to PDFs from special collections, um, especially some of the papers about ex explorations of Bowling Green in the 19th century. Um, and we also did videos from the cave sing, karst field studies, um, and just kind of giving a deeper dive. Um, and it's also got some of the artworks that were on display and kind of displays a little bit more. And links to all of our uh, educational activities are on there too. Um, let me see if this will pull up. Some of the uh, educational activities, we had these, these guides and activities on bats that uh, Bat Conservation International posted, but we also have um, object lessons and that actually opens a, a Word document, but it's basically everything I've just talked about, it's actually a worksheet to go through and help you or your students develop a story based on one object or topic. So if you want to kind of take the, the principles I've been showing today and put them into practice, that is a great uh, document to just start with. And it's also something that is linked at least in the US to Common Core curriculum and WKU's curriculum. So hopefully that'll help um, for those of you who are international connected to curriculums in your own countries. Um, and finally, the big thing, um, since we could not give you an in-person tour, um, we have done a 360 degree tour. Um, you can actually click to view this in a new window, which will bring it up uh, at whatever size your window is, or you can even go into full screen. This is the 360 virtual tour. Um, it's very interactive. You use your mouse to point and click, drag around, um, and everything that we have, you can hit the info button and you can actually see uh, high resolution photographs and the, the object tags. You can read the labels. Um, and as you click the arrows, it will actually load up the next sections so that it actually feels kind of like you're walking through the exhibit. It's really cool. Um, but Eleanor did an amazing job on this. You can look at every single photograph. Um, you can read all of the labels and you can even uh, get up close photos of what the case displays look like. So um, because it is very highly interactive and uh, my computer is probably going to hate me for opening that link. Um, it's something that I highly encourage you to explore on your own. Um, so that is it for that. I know we're definitely early, but uh, Chris, if we, I mean, we take questions, we can talk. Yeah, well, that was just wonderful, Tiffany. I, I really um, I appreciate, you know, I would say the exhibit, but you're the the presentation you put together, I, I think, I, I dearly wish we were standing in there right now, mm -hmm. <laughs> or back in May, walking yeah. around in there, which we had planned. Um, uh, um, Tiffany also puts on, uh, with, with her colleagues, some wonderful little receptions with great snacks, <laughs> so I, I'm sad about that. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do have to say, one, one first thing that, that strikes me, and I'll, I'll see if Jim Lamoureux, um will concur on this, you, you said that one of the, the important things um, is to work at a, at a fifth grade level. Yes. And I, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is I have, um, in the past few years, uh, gotten involved in uh, various, uh, what's called expert witnessing on like environmental lawsuits and that, that sort of thing, providing expertise. And I think they told us that the first thing is when you're talking to lawyers and judges, it's actually a fourth grade level. So, so I'm glad we can step up a little bit for the, for the So, um, but anyway, it was really wonderful. Well, and, and I'd also like to, you know, as you did, we have, um, um, I believe, uh, Rick Toomey, who was very involved in this, uh, also uh, Superintendent uh, Barkley Trimble, and um, um, uh, Tim Pena, I think, on the line, who's uh, head of the Science and Resource Management, uh, or I don't think he certainly is the head of Science and Resource Management. And uh, I, I just really want to acknowledge the park and, um, and really just, just say, that, you know, as Tiffany said, there's a long, you know, not just in the, this project, but there's a very long history um, of uh, collaboration between WKU and WKU precursor schools that were here, you know, before WKU um, was established uh, and, and the cave and park. And this actually goes back more than 100 years um, when just like we do today when there's not a global pandemic. Well, in fact, even we, we're going to be taking students up there, it looks like, even though there is a global pandemic and we're going to, we're going to go in small groups. Um, but 
but teachers from these schools in Bowling Green, um, you know, Western Kentucky Teachers College and, you know, these various precursors, you know, have been having trips, um, you know, up, up to Mammoth Cave really for, you know, more than 100 years. And one of the links, uh, it kind of went by in, in pa passing that I, I saw that um, uh, Tiffany had up there were some um, some links to articles about like this very early history, you know, the old trips that, you know, they had back in the early 1900s. And <laughs> one of the things, you know, so, some things stay the same, some things are very different. And one of the different things is, you know, we talk about, you know, we, we those of us in uh, at WKU, you know, value the fact that we have this, you know, this treasure, you know, in the form of the park, you know, there's just, you know, it's only, you know, 40, 40 minutes away. Well, back, back in the early 1900s, uh, when they had the field trips to Mammoth Cave, they walked. <laughs> so, so they would take an entire day to walk up there. The girls apparently, um, the, the story is that the girls, at least in, you know, some, some trips that have been described, the girls are actually riding in wagons. Uh, drawn by horses, uh, the boys are walking behind, and the girls are taunting, you know, the boys the whole the whole way, um, and they would walk. It, it's it's um, I, I think uh, from WKU to the to the historic entrance is somewhere between twenty five and thirty miles, uh, somewhere somewhere in there, and one of the um, I, I guess the things that, that sort of amazed so, so they would they would take a day to walk up there, they would camp for a few days and see the cave, and then they have a day to walk back. Uh, they would have competitions to see who could, you know, who could walk up there the fastest. And, and, and I think the thing that really, you know, blows my mind is sort of Tiffany has introduced, you know, about reading about those trips is that um, those of you who have been, have been in the park may, um, may remember there's a beautiful, spectacular surface area called uh, Cedar Sink, which is just this huge, you know, enormous, big, um, you know, sink hall, just, just beautiful. And the road that was, um, it, it's been modified a little bit, but the road, you know, if you would have walked from, from WKU to, to Mammoth Cave back in the day, that road skirts right at the very edge of Cedar Sink. You would, you know, on, on your pathway, you would stop and, you know, I mean, you could just lean over, you know, about three feet and, you know, look down into a big gaping abyss. And, uh, and, and, and the part that just gets me is they describe stopping, you know, and then taking, taking a break and exploring, Cedar Sink, and I'm thinking, about, you know, if I was walking, you know, 35 miles, I'd want to get to camp, you know, and the fact that they had enough energy to, you know, to take a side trip and explore Cedar Sink, I guess, is uh, pretty remarkable to me, so, um, but, but any, anyway, so I, I just really, you know, th this is obviously a collaboration between the museum, our department, um, the art department, and certainly Mammoth Cave, and I want to acknowledge, you know, acknowledge the park. I don't know if there's any, Rick, or having been involved if you know if you want to make some comments about your your involvement or perspective but but thank you all this is rick unfortunately i'm not going to be able to i really am going to need to get off to um participate in a call on cave trails construction project well that's good it was, a, it was a phenomenal experience working with it uh and i really enjoyed it and I'm really sorry that, that we haven't been able to open it live, but I mean, I think the, I, I'm glad the uh, virtual stuff is available uh, because that, that in itself is a wonderful resource. Thank you, Rick. Well, yeah, yeah, well th thanks, Rick. Just jump off when you need to. Um, you know, I, I guess a comment that I, that I just said in passing, and I want to acknowledge the park, you know, also, is that for most of the uh, pandemic, the, the tours have been closed. Um, I think re recently, uh, and, I, and I, as far as I know, it's still uh, the case where there's a self-guided tour um, that using appropriate social distancing, distancing you know, the uh, visitors have been able to get in, into the, back into the cave in a very limited way. Um, but I, I'd like to very much acknowledge, you know, my appreciation through the entire pandemic, there was, um, there have been state, uh, mandates, um, um, you know, by, by the governor in terms of, you know, limiting, you know, mass at times or limiting the size of groups and things. And throughout the entire pandemic, the park has been wonderful uh, that those of us that work in the cave, you know, either ex exploring, you know, with the Cave Research Foundation or uh, in, in my case and my colleagues working under permits to do scientific research, you know, within the constraints of the state rules, 
the park has allowed us, you know, to continue our research and, you know, go into the cave, you know, we're, we're wearing masks, we, you know, we're social distancing. Um, but, um, but, you know, that, that was, you know, I, I think a very, um, you know, uh, uh, well, a, a decision that, that, I, that I appreciate that they've done. Uh, one, one of the things that Rick, Rick pointed out, and, and, and I've, I've heard otherwise since, um, is one of the things, uh, and, and in fact, Rick, if you have seconds before you go off, um, you might mention this, but one, one concern is that when, when scientists are going into the cave, um, that there are bats in Mammoth Cave, and at, at least you know what what, the, what you learn in the media um, is that the virus came from bats in, in China. I think is at least one of the possibilities. Uh, yeah. So apparently, bats can can have coronavirus. Th th this one um, somehow jumped to people, and I guess there's at least the possibility that scientists going into Mammoth Cave and being in proximity to bats. There's at least you know some possibility that the virus could then sort of get back to bats, and now here's a new North American reservoir. Uh, it, it, for the if you have seconds, it, what what's the deal yeah. on that? I mean, that you you are correct. There is that concern, as you noted. Uh, these this coronavirus is closely related to ones in some bats in in China. Whether people got it directly from bats or through a secondary reservoir is still not clear, but it's certainly closely related to bats, to viruses that these other bats get. And as you noted, there is a concern. And so we have, we, we have canceled all, uh, all work that has people actually handling bats for the moment. And uh, um, in le the, the National Park Service has done this as a policy that we're not we're not handling bats unless it, it, there is mission critical nat, need to know now reasons for doing so. Until we can find out, there are experiments going on trying to infect bats, and and we'll see whether they can catch it or not. And but until then, we're trying to be very uh, cautious and not expose the bats too closely to potential for coronavirus. So it's, it's, it, we're, it's not clear absolutely that it can happen. And we also know there are other animals. I mean, for instance, the state of Kentucky has, um, has stopped permits for, whole, for working with felids, cats, or mustelids, skunks, weasels, because we, minks, because we know that those animals also can get coronavirus from people and can, can potentially spread it amongst themselves and possibly back to people. There was a mink farm in, in uh, I think it was the Netherlands uh, that's had this problem. So we're just trying to be very cautious in not creating new reservoirs that would be problematic. Well, caution. <laughs> it seems like that's the, the the prudent way to go. But I, I like I said, I appreciate the balance you know that the park has had as you know as far as the work continuing and you know okay. cer certainly safety. Unfortunately, I will have to get off now. I enjoy. Yeah, what I was able to see. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Well, in, in fact, I'll say for those of you, um, you you may have seen up up on the wall in one of. Um, Tiffany slides, but for those of you that don't know Rick, who just jumped off, he's the uh, cave resource specialist uh, for Mammoth Cave National Park, um, and has been um, uh, worked. At, he's he's actually been at, at the at the park uh, for you know for a number of years now, but even worked even even before that as a scientist and uh, cave explorer for for really for many many years. So I, I really appreciate his his involvement. So. Um, well, let's see. There's a, there's a, a few others. Are anybody have any any questions or or other kind of comments? I, I guess we had early. It's not the end of the world. I don't think anybody's got any other things to do. One know. thing you might one thing you might tell them about Chris is the uh, book on Mammoth Cave that Springer uh, published several years ago, and uh, it's a oh. beautiful book. It covers the history and the the uh, geology, hydrogeology, and everything, and uh, would, it's a tremendous resource that. I would presume you have there at the museum, or if not, would be one to uh, 
special one to have. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, in fact, let me just say just a few more words about that. So, as, as Jim said, Springer uh, published in uh, 2017 um, a um, book, um, uh, Man of the Cave, I think A Natural and Human History is, is maybe the title. Um, and this is available, you know, both as hard copy, um, but, you know, through, uh, you know, di digital copies through Springer's website. And, um, and for anybody interested in Mammoth Cave, you know, in fact, I, you know, I, I, I don't know, you know, not, not certainly every day, but it sort of feels like it. I'm in one chapter or the other. Um, and what happened was that the, um, the editors, um, the, the primarily Horton Hobbs uh, from uh, Wittenberg University, who un unfortunately passed away before the book w was finished. Um, but Horton and a number of um, his colleagues, Rick Humi, the, whom with whom we just spoke, um, and Elizabeth Winkler, um, Rick Olson from Mammoth Cave National Park, and, and a few others, um, served as the editors in the book. And they invited uh, various experts um, to write chapters, you know, about different aspects of the cave. And by looking at it, um, you just if you look at the table of contents, you you get a sense of sort of why this is such a special place, because um, there's the you know not not just the geology and the uh, so Art, Art Palmer's got a wonderful chapter on geology, another on geomorphic history. Uh, Will White you know, um, and, and Elizabeth White on the um, on the hydrology. But also there's the, the history, um, the archaeology, you know, which is fantastic. Um, the, uh, that's, that, that, I mean, that, that, that's a whole story, story in itself. And, and in fact, I'll, I'll just sort of throw just, just one little bit, you know, to talk that, that sort of illustrates of just the incredible treasure that this place is. Um, so as we saw in Tiffany's, um, you know, presentation a few minutes ago, and I made a note of the, the sandals, that um, that she showed from a Salt's Cave, uh, those are somewhere in the order of 3,000 years old, and they were sitting there on the on the cave floor for 3,000 years, um, just because the cave, you know, has you know it, it's relatively dry. The relative humidity is high, but it, it's it's dry enough where things are preserved. Uh, there may actually be some some of the evaporated minerals, you know, may sort of help kind of a, as a desiccant. But in any case, there's this organic stuff, the sandals, for example, you know, that, that's there preserved after thousands of years. And one of the, it, it, it sounds crazy the first time you hear about it, but one of the most, you know, incredible artifacts of many specimens have, have, which have been found um, is um, uh, something called paleo feces or paleo poop. Um, and that is these explorers went, you know, miles back in the cave, you know, up, up to, it's incredible, five miles from the nearest entrance with, with sticks for torches, 10 mile round trips. And so that they found artifacts and they would stop and use the bathroom from time to time and evidence of that is, is still there. And so, um, and, and at first you think, well, you know, you know, you know picturing somebody, an archaeologist corner on the floor looking for 3,000 year old poop seems like kind of an odd thing. Uh, but what happens is from those samples, they can date them, you know, first of all. So there's, you know, there's, you know, when that person, you know, was, was in the cave, they can look at it and see what they were eating. You know, the earlier um, examinations looked for seeds, nuts, uh, bones, whatever it is. And so, um, and one of the just, you know, maybe the most incredible thing about the cave altogether, certainly one of them, is that the earlier, so there's a, a bunch of these samples that have been found in the cave, um, dated, and what they have found is that the earlier samples have food that represents diets of what are called hunter, hunters and gatherers. These are people, you know, essentially wandering through the woods, you know, trying to, you know, to find enough to eat. So, you know, bones of, say, turtles or frogs or turkeys or nuts or, you know, whatever it may be, uh, fish. Um, but then somewhere about 3,000 years ago, there's a transition to horticulture, to actually domesticated plants, you know, say corn or uh, gourds. Um, and so the, and in the sort of history of, of human culture, the onset of agriculture is one of the most significant milestones because, you know, there's, you, you can actually read Springer's book and George Crothers uh, chapter in the, in the Manly Cave book about this. Um, but, you know, there's so much to it because, 
you know, you're talking about shifts in how people are interacting, um, one with the environment, they're starting to control the environment. You know, they're not just subject to whatever they can find. They're starting to actually influencing, you know, production of, of their own needs by, um, you know, modifying the environment through ag culture. But it's also a change of how they're interacting with, with one another. You know, this, this means, uh, you know, certain types of cooperation, you know, which, which you know, and, and I'm not an archaeologist, but, but I guess, you know, there, there's a sense that that's connected to, you know, early um, people living in communities and maybe ultimately local governments and, you know, various interactions. Uh, so that happened a number of places, but at Mammoth Cave, it's actually dated from the, the diets of these people in these, these samples. Um, they, they, there's been hormone analysis. They, they found out that um, there's, a, there's a few samples where it's not clear, um, but every sample where there is a, um, um, where there is a clear um, uh, hormonal signature, these, these were males. And, and so apparently it was dominated, at least as far as we know from, from male exploring, or, or maybe the women were too polite to, to use the bathroom, maybe that's it. Um, but the, um, uh, so, so, so anyway, you know, from any chapter of that book, um, yeah, there's just a huge wealth of information. So, so it's available on, on the internet. I think if you just put Springer and, and Mammoth Cave in, it will come up pretty easily. Um, I'll, I'll mention also, uh, just coincidentally, um, there, it's, it's not quite as readable as, as Springer's wonderful book, um, but a group of us um, uh, rec recently, uh, well over the last five years, have produced a, a, a National Park Service document called the Mammoth Cave Natural Resource Condition Assessment. Um, and uh, we're, we're t believe it or not, finishing it today, just by pure coincidence. Um, th this is something we started in 2004, and it's a, um, it's essentially a snapshot of the condition of all resources in, uh, well, most of the, you know, a, a selected range of the resources. So, you know, trees, bats, the, you know, how, how dark the night sky is, stalactites, water quality, deer, um, snakes, you know, every, you know, virtually everything. And, and I guess since I'm at, and that's going to be available also on the, on the internet uh, shortly. Um, <laughs> the reason I say today is that we worked on this, the, the, this for years with the great patients of the park. Um, it turned out to be um, 520 pages, which turns out to be 1.3 million characters if you include the spaces. So we say it's a, a bigger thing than any of us have ever done before. And the, the special thing today is we've been back and forth, you know, with the editors, with the Park Service publication teams. And about a month ago, um, we got what I was you know, kind of hoping was, you know, the very last revisions. And, and in that huge document, there was about three or 400 small corrections to make, you know, a typo or, you know, a, a date on a reference. And so, you know, we went through those one by one, um, turned it in. Uh, yesterday, to my delight, they said, well, there's one more round. But there are 17 corrections, and they're you know I've been through most of them. They're uh, uh, just you know dates, you know the, the the reference, you know this you know the citation is 2013, and the in the reference list is 2014. So so uh, last night I went through the first eight of them. So after five years, I'll tell I don't know if Tim's still on. There are right now seven corrections to make out of the 1.3 million characters, and I'm going to do that uh, as soon as I jump off here. Uh, and so once that's done, that'll be available you know, also on the, um, on the, the park services web website. And like I said, it's, it's technical, um, but essentially it's everything you ever could possibly want to know about the park, uh, plus about 30 times more that you probably don't uh, care about. So anyway, but thanks for bringing that up, that up, Jim. Yeah, it's a wonderful resource. Yeah, these are terrific resources, and that's part of an overall uh, series on cave and car systems of the world. They're actually 15 books in that right now uh, that cover uh, different countries or states. There's uh, Romania and a, a number of, of different uh, books. And then there's also a, a book series called Advances in Carts Sciences that would be of, uh, of interest possibly to, to some of the people as well. And they're about, Absolutely. we've just published our fifth book in that series. Great. And, and the, uh, you know, the, the series that includes the Mammoth Cave one, um, there, it's, it's a wide range of things. It's not just kind of highly technical things, um, but great stories there. You know, one about um, that Will White and his colleagues have written about the uh, cave exploring and 
the Burnsville Cove area of Virginia, some of the great caves of the eastern U.S. and, you know, about the, you know, not just the geology, but the history and how these were found. So, um, you know, so a combination of both science and, and uh, great stories for those interested in caves. Great. Well, yeah, thank you, Jim. Yeah, and if you go to www.springer.com, then you can uh, find both the Cave and Car Series of the World uh, information about it and also the advances in, in car system, car science. Great. Yeah, thanks very much. You're welcome. Let's see. Are there any other comments or, or questions? Okay. Well, what, what, what do we do to wrap up here, Tiffany? Uh, uh, just, just wonderful. I've never seen you give a presentation and it just it was wonderful. Oh, thank you. So, uh, you must have um, been paying attention in school. That was just great. <laughs> Yeah, um, I dropped some of the links in the chat, so uh, just feel free to take the 360 tour on your own time. Um, feel free to share things, and of course, if you have questions, you know, want to know about working more with museums, I'm happy to answer them, but uh, I think that's that's pretty much right. it. Well, maybe the, the, the last thing, if you take the, the virtual tour, uh, one thing I'd, I'd direct you to, because it, it was it was fun, um, and uh, some I particularly enjoyed, and Tef uh, Tiffany, um, one, one of the things she talked about was that um, she had found five or six, I think, I can't remember how many there were, but these old prints, you know, of things in Mammoth Cave, you know, from the 1800s, yeah. you know, this scene or that, that scene. And so, um, and we um, made a selection of, you know, that's what she called the, the, the rock, the rock stars. stars. The first <laughs> community. And she showed an example, you know, from Art, Art and Peg Palmer. And um, and one thing I did when kind of uh, so, you know selecting those people was those of you in the cave community will know that there's a certain um, uh, I don't know how to describe it exactly but but let's say among cavers there's at least a certain percentage of them that sort of have their own <laughs> are on their own wavelength or you know uh, you know some some quirkiness to some degree and I was I was mindful of that about picking people you know around around the world um, who. Uh, you know who who could comment on those, and so so some of the comments that came in are are a lot a lot of fun. You know, yeah. basically here's this ancient, you know, this print from the 1870s, and um, you know, so um, P Peter Malik, you know, is, is from uh, our, our friend from Sl uh, Slovakia, for example. Uh, uh, you know, so as a scientist today, when I look at this picture that's over 100 years old, you know, what 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 do I notice or what do I think about it? And and so that's a fun little section, yeah. you know, to look at there. So. Yeah, it was right. really fun to see their responses to those. It was, yeah. it was definitely unexpected. Yeah, yeah, I, I was uh, I was expecting that. So, 